This episode is sponsored by Audible. Space is awesome, and newer and better telescopes show us more of its wonders every day. How much cooler would it be to see them with your own eyes? This year will mark the 50th anniversary of the first time a human ever set foot on a celestial body besides the Earth. It wasn't that much earlier that we even reached orbit, just a few hundred kilometers above our planet, a thousandth the distance to the moon, and a millionth the distance to other planets. We've spent a lot of time talking about getting off Earth and colonizing new worlds, and I thought it was time to talk about some of the other reasons to get out there. One of which is to see the place, take some photos, and go home so you can rave about it to your friends, family, and any captive audience. The solar system has a lot of wonders to attract tourism, and we'll look at some of those today, but our focus will also be on how the science, technology, and economics of space travel are likely to alter space tourism from conventional modern tourism, where travel is quite quick, and how that would shift with cost dropping. The first place we'll likely see mass tourism, because we're already seeing the start of it, is right in low orbit. This is what most folks mean by space tourism, going up to a space station and floating around in zero gravity. Neat place to be for the view too, as you can see the Earth quite clearly in a way eagle eye view doesn't begin to express, since the eagles are flying way, way below us. I suspect that most space stations in orbit will feature a down-facing port window, where you could literally hover over the world, weightless, and watch it spin below you. The sun also rises and sets every couple hours up there, so I'd imagine one of the first tourist restaurants on a space station will take advantage of that, and possibly a sunrise cafe. We should expect most space stations, particularly in the early period, to be simple rotating habitats with a zero-g hub like the design from the Gateway Foundation we looked at in Space Ports. Tourists, particularly in the early period, will probably be most eager to play in zero-g. Problem is, it's actually rather tricky to prepare food, eat food, or get rid of already digested food in zero-g. Tricky to do those things neatly anyway, so I suspect the novelty of zero-g would wear off quickly, and the off-axis sections will be the desirable spots when playtime is over. These needn't have normal Earth gravity, just enough to make sure things fall down, especially for eating and sleeping. While being in zero gravity is likely to be something folks only want to experience for a few hours at a time, zero-g sports and activities are likely to be a huge new thing for us that will stay huge for the rest of human history. Going on a trip to play or watch a team in person is one motive for space travel, but also a good reminder that a lot of tourism is about seeing things humanity has built, not naturally occurring wonders. Activities you can only do in space will be a good way to fill some of the long travel time to see those wonders, and as modern cruise ships prove, often the journey is as important as the destination. And yes, for the folks who keep asking, we will do an episode on space sports sometime this year. Yet those natural wonders will drive early tourism away from Earth, and there are a lot of natural wonders out there. We mentioned how on a space station the sun rose and set every couple hours, not once a day. But in a way, that's not a very good sunrise to watch, very quick, but up on the moon the days last a month, so there's not a few minutes of wonder but many hours. Unfortunately there's no air there so it's not really very pretty, just a giant burning orb you dare not look upon. Similarly, while looking at Earth would be neat, the Earth doesn't rise or set on the moon, as the moon is tidally locked to Earth, so it just sits there in the same place in the sky, turning slowly and having the day-night terminator creep across it. Where is the sunrise most awesome in our solar system? The sun is just a blinding white death ball on the airless moon, and it's even worse on Mercury. Mars? Well yes, there is enough air there for a real sunset, and the day is about the same length as here, and it will be different shades too, butterscotch skies in the day, blue near the sun for sunsets, rather the opposite of Earth, so it's worth making a stop for maybe. 
How about the moons of the gas giants? Titan's the only one with a real atmosphere, indeed a very thick one, and the sun is still bright enough to give rather excellent and very long ones, as its day is a couple weeks long, plus you get to see the rings of Saturn. The gas giants all have rings, though none compare to Saturn's, and they all have moons that would be wonders to behold, though in truth the view of those planets and their rings from their moons is likely to be an even better sight, and from those moons you will often be able to see the sun rise or set on the planet they orbit. But the true queen for sunsets is likely to be Venus, whose thick atmospheres and clouds, and freakishly long day, would make the event a true sight to behold and last a very long while. Not from the ground mind you, but from floating cities far above the molten wasteland of the surface, which would be quite the tourist attraction themselves. You might also go hang gliding, though you'd need to wear a breathing mask and acid resistant suit, as it does rain acid there, and while those clouds would make for spectacular sunsets, they themselves aren't made of water. Speaking of hang gliding, lots of folks like to visit the Grand Canyon or other gorges and some of those do hang gliding, but even though most of our canyons on Earth are cut by rivers, and lakes, rivers, and oceans aren't too common off Earth, there are some amazing canyons out there. Valles Marineris on Mars is 4,000 kilometers long, and up to 200 wide and 7 deep. Indeed while Mars' atmosphere is thin, flight is possible there, and any early terraforming efforts would see the atmosphere become thickest in those canyons. Pluto's moon Charon has many chasms itself, the biggest of which is Argo Chasma, not to mention vast ice fields, geysers, and cryovolcanoes. Mars possesses a few more impressive valleys too, though it should be noted there are some others throughout the solar system, often on various moons, including our own. Ithaca Chasma on Saturn's moon Tethys, which at 2,000 kilometers long and 100 kilometers wide, runs nearly the circumference of the whole moon, cutting a shallow slash across Tethys. Just across the way on Pluto is Slepniofasa, one of the massive spider cracks of the Tartarus Dorsa. So someone wanting to tour the Grand Canyons of the Solar System will have no shortage, though Earth itself has many of the best. But if one is hang gliding on Mars in the Mariner Valley, they might instead start on the mountains of Tharsis, not all that far away. For a mountain climber, Mars is the ultimate challenge though, besides having several of the tallest mountains, including Olympus Mons itself, its lower gravity helps with climbing, but you have to bring your air with you or some suit able to create it, which will negate that low gravity, as that would get heavy. Not the most challenging climb, as it has a very mild slope on top of low gravity, but it makes up for it in sheer height. For the casual climber, low gravity and a lack of erosion means there are many mountains of breathtaking height you might scale scattered around the other planets, moons, and asteroids. The tallest on the moon, Mons Huygens and Mons Hadley, rival Mount Everest, though height is tricky to define when there is no sea level, and you'd likely drive a rover up them rather than climb. Indeed you can see a great shot of Mons Hadley in the background of the Apollo 15 mission. I imagine many will too, historical landmarks will be popular for tourism, and the solar system the Apollo landing sites are guaranteed to be the most ancient of these, unless we find some abandoned alien base on the dark side of the moon, of course. That does raise the question of preservation. Some tourists stepping on Neil Armstrong's one small step and erasing his footprint would likely cause a hue and cry so loud you could hear it even in the vacuum of space. How do you go about making sure people can get up close and feel part of our priceless history without damaging that history? Ownership of those sites matters a lot too, while for the Apollo missions in the short term at least, those would presumably be something few would dispute belong to the US, to at least administer, property in space is at best a poorly defined concept thus far, and likely to be a huge political and legal feud in centuries to come especially where there's revenue to be had. Olympus Mons on Mars is bound to be something a lot of folks would like to own or have a contract to maintain. Preservation in the face of tourist damage, property disputes, and funding issues is nothing new to us of course, but space is likely to put a whole new spin on it. Plus, you might lose many of these if you decide to terraform those worlds. 
and how do you compete with alternatives? Used to be if you wanted to see something, you had to go there. Nowadays you have the option for photos, and when those were new, folks did object to making those publicly available of sights and art lest it damage visitors. Indeed a lot of old radio and TV was made when there were objections to recording it, as the actors were used to doing a show many times and getting paid each time. Same though, being able to see photos of things often whets the appetite to be there in person, which arguably drives more tourism than it prevents. But this was all before virtual reality, and if that's good enough, some might see no reason to go to the moon even if it was a one day trip that cost the equivalent of a couple days wages. With good enough VR, you can not only visit the place but touch it without a spacesuit, or even relive the memory and emotions of the first person who went there. Indeed with advanced enough tech, a lot of tourism might become that form, or more dramatized equivalents like we see in the film Total Recall. Visiting the moon is awesome, visiting it as the first explorer, or while genuinely believing you were that explorer, or on a vital mission to save humanity, is probably even cooler. Against that we have the reality of space travel. Nowadays only the very richest could afford even a trip to orbit, but even if that falls to the bargain prices we contemplate in the Upward Bound series, it's likely to be fairly pricey and, more important, very time consuming. Virtual reality or making the trip remotely via download into some Android might be an option, though the tech implied for the latter would probably mean the virtual reality was beyond merely good. Lots of travel time, even with an inexhaustible fuel supply, if you're limited to 1G of acceleration, experiencing the equivalent of normal Earth gravity on the voyage, the Moon can be reached in a few hours. But even Mars at its closest, just under 60 million kilometers, would take a day of full thrust to reach the turnover point and the same to slow down. Fortunately, under constant acceleration, travel times rise with the square root of distance, so quadruple the distance, double the travel time. Meaning even distant places like Pluto might be reached in a few weeks. Of course, even in an energy rich economy, that sort of casual expenditure of fuel is unlikely to be approved of, and such an economy is still a long way off, so more likely these would be slower moving ships and modeled more on cruise ships than airplanes. This also means a big focus of the tourism would be on those ships, especially in the early days when those ports of call might not have many luxuries, so you're relaxing on the ship while you venture to see the solar system. I don't doubt we'd ever see any real tourism until ships could achieve enough speed to be making the journeys without plotting minimum energy home and transfer orbits, which would make any trip take years, but interplanetary voyages of weeks or months certainly would still attract a lot of people, especially if the ship was accommodating. Alternatively, we need to remember this solar system is not just a handful of planets, or even their moons though a place like Jupiter or Saturn with so many moons would be an ideal archipelago for a space cruise ship to amble around rather cheaply and with modest travel times. In the asteroid belt, for all that it's nothing like as dense as we see in science fiction, things are pretty close and need virtually no thrust to travel between, and we have discussed previously how the asteroid belt is likely to be the first place we settle after the moon, possibly even before Mars or Venus. Many of those features, awesome canyons and mountains and craters, are abundant in the belt, and one could easily imagine cruise ships that slowly circled throughout major ports of call in the belt, on decade-long journeys that people simply joined for a few ports here or there. There are endless canyons, caverns, lava tubes, and craters you can go spelunking around in the solar system, many of vast size, as gravity and erosion don't collapse them often and it's safer to crawl around inside them for the same reason. Many of these might be pressurized by us too, so that you could float through them or walk and climb in low gravity. Interesting alternative though, since much of that settlement might be small mining colonies, and in Colonizing Ceres and Pluto we talked about how bigger settlements might send circuit caravans for trade around the asteroid belt or Kuiper belt. They might do that for tourism too. A lot of tourism trailblazers here on Earth were about legitimate businesses in some remote area and merely taught others about things they saw, inspiring others to follow suit. 
We picture miners coming to visit those bigger colonies to trade their goods and get some R&R, but it might go the other way. Maybe big cruise ships would be visiting ports of call, not just to pick up and drop off passengers, but be more like a traveling fair or carnival, which paints an interesting image of future asteroid belt spaceships as an interesting mix of freighter, retail store, sports arena, hotel, casino, and resort. At least in those early days, for those early colonies. As things develop, you'd see more specialization and more travel, going to Europa to scuba dive in the subsurface oceans, but as things grow the ratio of natural wonders to man-made stuff for tourism will alter too. You're going to start collecting new wonders, multi-kilometer wide domes over craters, terraformed lunar lava tubes, canyon cities in Mariner Valley on Mars, cloud cities on Venus, and probably all sorts of megastructures. Those could be something fairly mundane like enormous O'Neill cylinders, of which we expect to ultimately build billions of in our solar system, and each probably aiming to be a bit unique, or rather flashy and bizarre like some asteroid carved into a giant head like Mount Rushmore or Easter Island. Further ahead in time you might see true artificial worlds, some a mundane spherical shellboard, and others more peculiar, like a flat earth disc world where the whole thing was mini snaky beach islands, or a hoop world where the sheer rate of spin means gravity varied over the surface, from either of its two equators, highest on the outer and lowest on the inner, to what we call the poles, even though they are actually circles, not points. The weather on a flat earth is quite ideal amusingly, but a hoop world has decidedly crazy weather, and either might easily do well for tourist traps. Or we might see the belt shift from big rocks to many artificial cylinder habitats to a giant topopolis or rung world, huge rings around the sun of incomprehensibly large habitable areas, and in a topopolis one might take a classic cruise ship down the World River. Topopolises are incredibly long and skinny, so that it's essentially one long stretch of skinny land, and I always picture them having some single long river that makes it akin to how ancient civilization on the Nile was, a nation you could see across in one direction but spend weeks crossing the long way. Of course in a Topopolis, even a single layer one, the river isn't going to be thousands of kilometers long but more like a billion so you could spend your whole life traveling down the river to a new town every day and take tens of thousands of years to get back to where you left. So voyages in space for tourism do not necessarily require very long times of thumb twiddling on a ship, as the solar system might fill up fairly rapidly. As we've often said of Dyson Swarms, they are nothing like the packed and crowded image we get when contemplating a Dyson shell but travel time between various neighboring habitats would be on an order of minutes and hours, not weeks, at very low speeds and energies. Of course high speeds don't necessarily mean high energies, and not just in the sense that people might travel as information, uploading to bodies at their destination, riding beams of light. There's more than one way to do that and we've talked many a time of using beaming technologies to push ships to huge speeds as we discussed in interstellar laser highways and beam powered ships. That still costs energy, though less than if you have to carry your fuel, and moreover, it can be reclaimed. It costs energy to move something up to high speed and more to slow it down, but if that energy is just light bouncing off a big sail, you can bounce it back to be reclaimed, and while you'll never break even on this process, ships moving down lanes pushed by energy beams to speed up or slow down can be done for a lot less total power loss than what you put in. Similarly, habitats on the same orbital path can be connected by tethers where such a crossing requires virtually no energy, and without atmospheric drag allows quite high speeds too. This begins to paint a future, maybe even just a handful of centuries from now, where a truly enormous solar system, overflowing with natural and man-made sites, could see billions of tourists traveling to and fro every day, at great speed but not in great haste nor at great cost. A billion worlds, all each their own unique place, 
with a unique history and unique sights, all there for anyone to see and live on and share. Such a time is quite a ways off, but in the short term, as these things go, I suspect we'll begin seeing genuine space hotels in the next generation or so, and hopefully by centuries in, some on the moon and those in orbit numerous and cheap enough, and us as a civilization prosperous enough, that anyone who really wants to can afford to make the voyages. In this regard, tourism is one of the last stages of development, as it comes after you've explored, pioneered, and developed a place. The fact that we can only see a fraction of our own planet in a normal lifetime reinforces my bemusement at people worrying that radical life extension will be bad because life will become boring. Going scuba diving in Europa's hidden seas, or skiing on the frosty slopes of all the outer moons and dwarf planets doesn't strike me as boring. It will be quite a while before we get there, but not so long before we get to float in zero-g or strap on some wings and fly around bubbles of air orbiting above our pale blue dot. I don't doubt that as we get out and colonize our solar system, we'll find many more wonders and make even more, but if you're interested in touring our solar system today, I'd recommend the Grand Tour series by Dr. Ben Bova. Bova is one of science fiction's most prolific authors, as well as science fact and has authored over a hundred works, about two dozen of which are in his Grand Tour series, focusing on the colonization of our solar system. While there are overall story arcs connecting the works, you can begin almost anywhere in the series, much like our Outward Bound series here on SFIA, and I myself started with Mercury, which is about halfway through the official chronology, which begins with Power Sats, written that same year or you could start with Mars, the first one he wrote. Wherever you want to start, all those books are available on Audible, and most are narrated by Stephen Rudnecki, one of my favorite readers. Wherever you choose to start in the series, you can get a free copy of that first book at audible.com slash Isaac, or text Isaac to 500-500. Audible offers a 30-day free trial but each month you're a member you now get a free audiobook and two Audible Originals, and those credits roll over to the next month or year and stay yours, along with any books you got even if you later discontinue your membership, and with your convenient app you can listen on any of your devices and seamlessly pick up where you left off, whether you're listening at home, commuting, running errands, or off jogging or at the gym. Audible makes it cheap and easy to access a vast collection of amazing stories. Also, if you're an Amazon Prime member, for a limited time you can start an Audible membership and save 66% on your first 3 months, a total of $30 off. That's like getting 3 months for the price of 1. You'll pay just $4.95 per month for the first 3 months, after that it's only $14.95 per month and the offer is valid till July 31st. We were talking about wonders we might find in the solar system or create today, and next week we'll start our examinations of one such, ecologies which might naturally occur or be created in space, void ecologies, and we'll look at the popular notion of living ships, in space whales and bioships. Such natural void ecologies might occur in distant alien systems we may visit, and the week after that we'll return to our Alien Civilization series to consider aliens who might visit us, though not for friendly reasons or tourism, in Invasive Aliens. For alerts when those and other episodes come out, make sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the notifications bell, and if you enjoyed this episode, hit the like button and share it with others. Until next time. Thanks for watching and have a great week.